student projects and how we how we hope those student projects will work and how they're developed and so on. Um, importantly, we'll then talk about some of the both opportunities and responsibilities or expectations for what the students will do after the course. So this is not just a one month in the summer, but once you're part of the Polaris project, you're part of the Polaris project, uh, and uh, and that you know, that creates opportunities, but also some responsibilities. Uh, we'll say a little bit about assessment. That's an important part of what we're doing. I mean, we're we're hoping to do a lot of good on on a lot of different axes, and we want to be able to demonstrate that to NSF and 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 also to figure out what we're not doing so well, so we can improve it. So we'll we'll say just a few words today about that that process of assessment, and then kind of at the end we'll open it up for questions and comments and and whatever is on your guys' mind. Let's see the next slide. Um, all right, who are we? Uh, we have a remarkably big group this year. There's going to be 33 people total traveling to Cherski that are uh, affiliated with the Polaris project this year. This is the biggest group we've ever had. That um, that's really exciting. It's going to be a challenge. We're certainly going to fill the Northeast Science Station to capacity, but we're um, uh, we're going to be able to get a lot done. Too. So I just want to uh, kind of go through who we are. Um, this slide that hopefully you're all seeing now shows the undergraduate students, which are really the focus of this this project. And I think there's well, I can't remember now. Is it 11 new undergraduates and two returning undergraduates, something like that? So um, uh, from all around the U.S., from Russia, a really uh, interesting, diverse group of students. Um, that will have their first crack at the Polaris project this year. And then we have um, two students, Dylan Broderick and Luda Ludwig, who will be returning for a second year. And, and each year um, we've had one, two, three, I guess one year we had four returning students. And that's a really neat experience, I think, for all of us. They get to you know follow up on the research they started in their, in their first year, but also they uh, kind of bring a lot of knowledge and, uh, you know, uh, Fill a nice role in um, in between the new students and, and the rest of us who have been there a bunch of years. So we're thrilled to have them back this year. Um, we also will have two graduate students with us this year. Travis Drake, who's now working on his PhD at the University of Colorado. He was an undergraduate at Carleton College, and he um, first participated in the Polaris project in let's see, 2009, and then. Um, came back for a second year as an undergrad in 2010. So this will be his third summer in Chersky, and we're yeah, excited about that. Uh, Dave Mayer, who's a PhD student um, at Clark University with Karen Fry, one of the PIs on the project, um, he will be joining us this year. Um, I, I already mentioned uh, Mark, the high school teacher, will be with us as part of the Polar Trek program, and that's a really neat program that um, we'll all learn a lot more about. Uh, but it's, I'm not sure how many teachers Polar Track will be sending to the Arctic and Antarctic this year, but it's a, it, this is the first time that the um, Polaris Project has had one of those teachers. I've worked with Polar Track uh, twice, brought teachers to the Arctic pre-Polaris, but this will be our first Polaris Project experience, so I'm, uh, that, that's great. Um, this year will be the first year we'll have a physician traveling with us, and um, this is a huge relief to me. We're again, we're going to have our biggest group ever—33 people. This is probably the biggest um, international expedition to the Siberian Arctic ever, um, and you know, it's it's not like a—it's it, a—it's a remote environment, and so it's a big comfort to have somebody there with us. A, you know, a trained emergency physician if if we need that person. And um, Dave Young is—he's. Uh, um, a resident at Mass General Hospital, and um, we're connected uh, not just with him, but with the program that he's part of, the emerg emergency medicine program, the wilderness medicine program. So if there ever was a problem in Cherokee, not only would we have Dave there, but would have all the Mass General Hospital uh, there to consult with. So that's a, um, that's a, that's a huge relief. Okay. Um, the list goes on. So uh, the, the divisions between all these different groups are kind of blurry. And it was a real challenge for me to figure out where to put people. But at any rate, um, there's uh, what we call the principal investigators. There are also several 
postdoctoral scientists. So postdoctoral scientists are people who've recently gotten their PhD, um, and it's sort of a, another year or two or three or four of training before, in general, they'd go to a you know a faculty position or something like that. But um, there's really very little distinction in most cases between the sort of what, who I have listed as principal investigators and the postdoctoral scientist, uh, uh, at least in terms of what happens in the Polaris project. Um, I listed a couple people there as visiting. Uh, Mike Coe's a scientist at the Woods Hole Research Center. Um, he's, he'll be with us just for the first two weeks. Um, can't even remember why I listed Rob Spencer as visiting. I guess it's, this is because it's his first, uh, his first time to Chersky. Uh, he's also a scientist at the Woods Hole Research Center. Um, if people are, I'm not following along in the chat, so if anyone's trying to get my attention, John, break in or something and, and let me know. I'm okay. Um, there are several central people in the project who won't be actually traveling to Siberia this year. And this, this is always the case. Um, and here's the list of those people this year. So um, John Jade, you, uh, most of you have heard speak, introduced things at the beginning of this talk. He's at St. Olaf. And this will actually be his first year he hasn't been there. Bill Sobzak is the same thing. Um, Chris Linders, the guy who kind of spearheads you know, he's a photographer and a videographer, and um, he does all kinds of outreach sorts of activities. Um, anyways, I won't say a lot about all these guys. You'll hear more for them, from them later. Uh, many of them will be giving uh, these sort of online presentations over coming weeks. So he's Chandra, Andy Bunn. And, and Joe Bell is at um, St. Olaf College, and she's the person who directs the uh, assessment activities that we do. Uh, I think this is the last slide of the participants. It takes a while to get through 33 people. Um, this is kind of a, the, the ones I listed as other participants were the folks I wasn't quite sure how to classify otherwise. So um, uh, Kate Bolagina, I'll start with, is, plays an absolutely central role in this project from the start as we were thinking about developing it. She's a, a research assistant at the Woods Hole Research Center and the manager of our labs there. Um, she's a joint Russian-U.S. citizen, so she's the one who gets us to where we need to go and gets us back and um, coordinates activities in the labs in Chersky, and she's just absolutely central, and you'll get to know her well. Um, the other person I'll mention there uh, on this list um, is Tom Quinn. Tom works for uh, an organization called Kohler Field Services, and they're a contractor with NSF. Uh, their job is providing uh, Arctic logistics logis for scientists and NSF-funded scientists in the Arctic. And uh, Tom will be going with us, uh, uh, I guess, for the first 10 days or two weeks, something like that. Um, I've traveled with Tom to Russia, I think, a couple of times and worked with him for a really long time. And he's got a bunch of responsibilities, um, and some of it's related to safety, some of it's related to just making sure that things go as smoothly as possible there. So we need to have him with us this year. And finally, and importantly, um, it's not just that this group of us is traveling from from the states and from other parts of Russia to Chersky, but there's a fantastic staff at the Northeast Science Station. Um, the key players uh, are listed here. Um, the station started, I guess, almost 30 years ago. It, it was founded by Sergei Zimov and Sergei Davidov. Uh, and their families are you know, absolutely central. Nikita Zimov plays a huge role in the um, Polaris project. So you get to know these folks really well. And uh, you know, importantly, also the cook, um, the first year of the Polaris, well, I'll say more about that in a few minutes. Um, let's see what's next. OK, some of the big goals of the Polaris project. Um, you know, we always kind of put the, the summer field course or um, it's not really a field course, this research experience at the center of it. It really is a center part of the Polaris project. But then on this figure uh, around it, it shows several uh, additional goals or foci of the project. And I've highlighted three of them that are um, perhaps more important than the others, or at least ones that I want to say a little bit about right now. Um, one of them is in train new Arctic researchers. So that is, um, that's talking about the undergraduates that are in the project. That's talking about the postdocs, that's talking about the young sort of faculty, that's trying to, basically we're trying to click more people on the excitement, the importance 
uh, the fun of doing research in the Arctic and 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 particularly in the in the Russian Arctic, the Siberian Arctic, where it's uh, it's Russia has by far the biggest share of the Arctic, and um, and there's a lot of new work to be done there. Travis, I did just see that. Travis, you're in trouble. Um, uh, another goal is advancing the science, so it's not just a, you know, um, not just a, a training experience, but we're actually doing fundamental new science, and you'll all be part of that, and you'll all make some new discoveries, and, and that's, uh, you know, that's that's one of the big things we're trying to do. Uh, and uh, third main emphasis is trying to get the story of the Arctic and climate change, what's happening in the Arctic, out to a broad public audience. And I won't say a lot about that right now, but we'll all have some responsibilities there, whether it's giving talks when we um, get back to our home institutions, uh, blogging during our time in Siberia, and before and after, we'll all be expected to do that. So there's lots of different things that we'll, we'll do there. Uh, okay, a bit about safety. Uh, first of all, if you haven't already had your physical and sent those forms into um, uh, Mass General Hospital, please do that as soon as possible. We want to get all that stuff in. Uh, get it in now. It should be in now, but if you haven't done it, do it now. Uh, there are lots of different possible hazards in Siberia. I mean, one is just that we're incredibly remote. So if anyone gets sick or if anything happens, it's a, it's a challenge to deal with. And then there are just lots of potential hazards of injury and, and so on. So we want to always be aware of those things, think about how to minimize the risks, and also think about how to deal with them as they happen. I'm not going to go into that in any great detail right now, but we'll talk about it a lot uh, along the way. And um, we'll all work together to keep things as safe as possible. OK, how do we uh, actually? get there. What, what is this trip actually going to look like? I can't remember how much of this I've sent around so far, but this is the basic skeleton of our travel schedule. So we'll, we'll be flying, at least those of us starting in the States, we'll, we'll be starting in different places in the States, and we'll all converge in New York at JFK Airport on Tuesday of June 26th. Um, later on, I think our flight from JFK to Moscow leaves at 5 o'clock or something in the afternoon. I can't remember exactly, but we'll hop on a flight to Moscow on the evening of June 26th. It's an overnight flight to Moscow, so we'll arrive sometime late morning, midday in Moscow on Wednesday the 27th. We'll spend one night in Moscow. That afternoon when we get there, we'll uh, hop on a bus sort of a chartered bus, go see a few main sites in Moscow, Red Square, the Kremlin, and so on. Go back to the hotel, go to bed, um, and then the next day, we'll have uh, a lot of, lot of time waiting in the airport before we hop on another overnight flight from Moscow to Yakutsk. The flight from uh, JFK to Moscow is about 10 hours. From Moscow to Yakutsk, it's six or seven hours, another overnight flight again. We arrive in Yakutsk uh, very early in the morning. Um, probably just have a couple of hours there before we hop on our final flight um, from Yakutsk to Chersky. So we'll arrive in Chersky if all goes as planned uh, on Monday, June 29th, after having a pretty brutal uh, few days moving from the U.S. to um, to Chersky. We'll pick up a couple of people in Moscow on the way, or, or maybe one person in Moscow, a couple of people in Yakutsk, and hopefully all all of us will get there. Um, on June 29th. We'll then have, uh, I guess, about three and a half weeks on the ground in Chersky before we turn around and head back the other direction, leaving um, Chersky for Yakutsk on the 24th. And um, unlike on the way in, we'll actually spend a night in, in uh, Yakutsk on the way out. So we'll leave Yakutsk on the 25th, get to Moscow on the 25th. We'll spend one night in Moscow and head back to the US on the 26th. Uh, in past years, we've had a um, spent an extra day in Moscow, and we've had a sort of a symposium where people did presented their research results, their projects. Uh, we did that in Moscow. Um, we're still going to do that somewhere. We'll have to think hard about when and where we want to do it. Um, it's going to be harder to do it in Moscow just because we're not spending as much time there. So, anyways, we'll think about that. And we'll figure out something. So, but you can all uh, anticipate giving presentations about your projects at the end of the project. Um, 
This is just a, a Landsat, a satellite image of the region around Chersky. You see Chersky there on the map. And um, the dots, I think this is from 2010. It just shows some of the locations where we sampled rivers and streams. And the point I want to make here is, well, one, it's a remarkable environment. And uh, essentially, the river is our highway. So we had uh, up river and down river at various times. Most of the work we do is in the you know relatively near vicinity of Chersky. But we have a couple of trips up and down river to see different environments. Um, I'm not going to say too much about this. This is just the Colima River watershed. It's about 800,000 square kilometers, something like that. It's the largest watershed on Earth that's completely underlain by permafrost. That's, you know, as you've all probably figured out by now, it's got this vast amount of carbon locked up in that permafrost. And for all different kinds of reasons, it's a fascinating uh, place to be, a fascinating place to study. And Chersky is just remarkably located where you have access to um, all different kinds of interesting environments. It's in the boreal forest, but uh, it's not too far from the tundra. So we'll actually go past the tree line and see the tundra and see, you know, just all kinds of remarkable things while we're there. OK, packing. We'll send out a list of what we recommend you all bring with you uh, before we leave. Uh, but I just want to emphasize one thing now is that it'll, you know, and we'll emphasize it again, and that is pack light. Um, the, it's a 20 kilogram per limit or per person weight limit uh, for travel within Russia. Um, we're also always bringing in lots of equipment and sampling supplies and so on. So we always go overweight and we always spend thousands of dollars for that um, excess baggage. So we want to try to minimize that as much as possible. I mean, you need to bring what you need to bring, but don't uh, don't bring bottled water. Um, uh, it's, it's basically, I think we figured out, it costs about $10 to move a pound of stuff from Moscow to Chersky. So you, things, extra pounds, add up to lots of money in a hurry. OK, a little bit about living, the living arrangements there. This, the river that you, that you see in the back, background is the Kolomo River, the, the, the big river. And in the foreground is the Pantaleja, one of the tributaries. And the Northeast Science Station, where we'll spend the vast majority of our time is on that um, bank of the Pantaleja. It looks sort of like a, a soil, a, the lighter colored, non-vegetated region is where the Northeast Science Station is. Um, in the, the first year of the Polaris Project was 2008. I think for the first two or three years, everyone lived on the barge. Um, the barge has five rooms. Each of them has four bunks. And our group size was small enough that we could all pile on the barge. Um, in the last year or two, the group's gotten bigger. And uh, we now um, divide people between the barge or uh, other, other, uh, other places to sleep on the, on the grounds of the Northeast Science Station. Um, there's just a few shots of the inside of the barge. It's one kind of common room where, up until now, all of our meals have been on the barge in this common room. I think this year, with our bigger group, we may shift to another building for most of our meals. Uh, but still, this is, this is a place that a lot, of, a lot of time gets spent in this sort of common area on the barge. Um, this is just what one of the dorm rooms looks like. And the guy on the left, that's Travis Drake, who will be with us again this year. Uh, this is um, one of the buildings that was purchased by Zimov, by the Northeast Science Station, just a few years ago, I guess. And we've used it for the past two years. Um, this was supposedly a television station during the Soviet period. Um, and now it's a, both, uh, a place where a bunch of us live. It's a place where we've actually set up some pretty good lab facilities. We've gotten a grant from NSF, the National Science Foundation, to equip it with some pretty nice equipment. So we can do quite a few analyses um, uh, there in Chersky. It's really improved dramatically over the now five years of the Polaris project. And I think it's also just about the most iconic uh, scientific building in the world, you know, this big searching quest for knowledge. Food. Um, our first year in 2008, food was pretty rugged, uh, it, it, unpredictable. It was, it was always plentiful, but not always delicious. Um, the last three years, we've had this cook Valentina, who was fantastic and fed us, fed us really well. Um, apparently, she will not be back this year, so I'm not sure what the arrangements will be. Um, I'm confident we'll get somebody who will, who will at least feed us plentiful food. Um, 
Beyond that, no guarantees. We've always had some vegetarians. They've always managed. Uh, you don't see a lot of vegetables during your time in Cherokee, but um, people figure it out. And um, let us know if you're a vegetarian, and we'll have some advice for you, uh, little extra things to bring, and so on. In general, it hasn't been bad, but it's a little bit more uncertain this year, just because we'll have a new cook, and we're not quite sure about that. Um, the uh, you've probably all seen some version of this on the website or heard about it or read about it, but we think a lot about the movement of, of water and stuff in water from the time the water hits the land in precipitation uh, to when it flows into the ocean. So we talk a lot about carbon and nutrients, uh, uh, both the stocks of them, the, the, the amount in the different parts of the, the system, as well as the magnitude of the transfer between the different parts of the system and the transformations. So that's kind of what links we think about everything in the context of the watershed, the Coloma watershed, and how things are moving um, from the watershed to the ocean. Uh, last year, I guess we've done this for a few years, but we formalized it a bit more last year, where we've had these sort of three overarching activities, what we called the um, aquatic survey, which we've actually been doing versions of for several years now, the <coughs> terrestrial survey, which um, I think progressed a lot uh, last year or the last couple of years, and we'll have to be even a bigger component this year. And then something that we've called the biodiversity survey, which really hasn't gotten off the ground too much yet. <clears throat> but um, these are kind of these overarching activities that uh, are generating a long-term data set that will be um, useful um, for many of us in the projects that are for many of the students in the projects that you're doing. Um, they're also data that are available to anybody out there in the <coughs> scientific community. Um, we'll all contribute to collecting data that uh, feed into these different uh, overarching activities. And some of the student projects will be um, very tightly coupled with these activities as, as well. Um, we'll emphasize this all along the way, but the, the quality of the data is really central to this. Again, it's not just a kind of a education experience, but we're actually doing fundamental science and we're making the data available to the broader scientific community. So we want to work really hard to have high quality data that will sort of stand the test of time and then 50 years from now somebody can look back on and, and use to help understand how, how the Arctic has changed. Um, just a few words about the student projects. They're generally done in small groups, and there are examples, there are times when students do individual projects, and, uh, but in most of the time, students work in groups but carve out their own little piece of some larger project. Uh, we're really flexible, or we've been really flexible in the specifics of what um, students work on, uh, but, you know, we try to keep it um, in the overall theme of the, the general issues that we're interested in that I sort of mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, I think it's likely that several of you will have a pretty good idea what you want to do before you arrive in Chersky, and others of you won't. And either one of those is, is fine. Uh, they're all different models of doing things, and uh, it can be really hard to, you know, to, to figure out what you want to do in an Arctic environment if you've you know, really don't know what to expect there. So if you're struggling trying to figure out what's going on right now, um, that's not at all surprising. We'll start feeding you a lot more information that will help generate some ideas. Um, but a lot becomes clear uh, or clearer when you actually arrive in Chersky and look around and, and see what the environment's like and what the facilities are like and what sorts of instrumentation is available and things like that. Uh, we try to build links between the different projects so somebody's not just off doing their own thing that's not tied in with what everyone else is doing. Uh, links with those overarching activities that I just mentioned are, are I think, beneficial. If, uh, you know, you can then tap into the data that the larger group is collecting and feed data into that, those overarching activities. And um, we'll, as I said, we'll start feeding uh, different ideas to you guys soon to um, spur your thinking a bit. Um, some of the expectations after the course, uh, some of these are related to the outreach component of the project. And so one of the things that we want you to do is 
everyone's going to need to get out and speak to the public audience. Tell them about your experience. Tell them about what the Arctic's like. Tell them about how climate change is impacting the Arctic from your own personal experience. So we want to, we want to, you know, there's 30 of us or something, 33 of us that are going to be there. If we all speak to a group of 30, that's a lot of people that are going to hear this story. Uh, you'll also be expected to continue uh, interacting on the website, so blogging. Um, and we want to try to generate a big following there and not have it just be for the month that we're in Siberia, but to keep it going. Uh, we haven't done too great of a job at that to date. Um, there's a big flurry of activity during the uh, during the, the expedition, and then it tapers off and pretty much dries up for the rest of the year. And that's kind of at the phase we're at right now. There's not that much happening on the website, but we want to start cranking that up soon, and, and we'll get everyone set up so that they can start posting um, uh, blogs soon. And it'll probably be Andy Bunn or Chris Linder who will um, facilitate that. Um, some students will have the opportunity to present at scientific conferences um, and even uh, author or co-author scientific papers. We've had lots of students in the past um, few years, that uh, lots of students and the rest of us that go to this uh, conference in San Francisco, the AGU, American Geophysical Union Conference. So I uh, expect that That'll happen again this year, or maybe another conference that we decide to focus on. Um, some students will have the opportunity to return. It's likely that some students will have the opportunity to return for a second year. And um, you know, one of the real benefits of this thing is that we're just all thrown in this environment together in tight quarters, and we get to know each other really well. And there's very little um, distinction between student and PI. I mean, we're all kind of learning together. Uh, and and it's an opportunity for anybody to ask questions at any time. So uh, we always get lots of questions about grad school, and it's really gratifying to um, well to be able to answer some of your questions about grad school and what it's like to be a scientist. And there are all scientists or there are participants kind of at all different levels of the hierarchy uh, in in science. Um, that's and so you'll get a lot of different perspectives and uh, get, a, get get your questions answered in a lot of different ways, which I think is a, a good thing. Uh, yeah, and you know the success of the project, of the Polaris project, is really dependent on the success of the students. So um, we're motivated to try to make this as valuable as an experience as possible for you guys. And it's, uh, we're all working hard at that. And you let us know when we're succeeding, and let us know when we're failing. But um, always remember that we're there to try to help and to try to advance your 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 scientific career or whatever it is that you're you're planning on doing. So use this as a resource as much as possible. Assessment, I said a little bit about this earlier. Joe Bell is a PI in the project who um, uh, is leading these efforts, um, both in terms of assessing the on-campus courses that several of the, the faculty teach at their home institutions. So that's exposing a pretty big population of students to, uh, Arctic, to the Arctic and climate change and so on. Um, and then the, the small subset of those get to participate in a summer field experience. And we'll also do assessment uh, associated with the summer field experience. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of that now, but you'll be hearing more about that later. Okay, this is, uh, uh, this is the last slide, and this is now where you guys can ask questions or make comments. Um, this photo, that's Sergei Zimov, who, um, as anyone would guess by looking at the photo, is a a uh, unique individual, and so real privilege to get to interact with him. Um, he's a, a remarkable guy, a remarkable scientist, and uh, um, yeah, and it, you'll, uh, you will not have met another person like this. So I'll stop there, and uh, we'll see how this technology works out for you guys um, asking questions or making comments or, or whatever. John, do you want to chime in? or? I guess people just raise their hand, and then we'll try to give them the ability to actually speak, or it could just be write text. If nobody says anything, then you have to just uh, continue watching me twiddle my thumbs. Somebody. Travis, I'll put you on the spot. If Travis is out there, um, how about 
giving you our perspective. Uh, having been there um, for two years as an undergraduate, now returning as a graduate student. Can you speak, Travis? I guess I have to turn my talk on. Can everyone hear me? I haven't tested out my mic yet. Awesome. Um, yeah, so this will be my third year with the project. Um, each year is a little bit different. Um, I'm excited to see how this year will go. I have a little bit more of an idea what my research question is going to look like. Um, uh, I don't know exactly what all you want to hear from me, um, but uh, yeah, if anyone has any uh, specific questions. My first trip, um, my first trip was uh, pretty groundbreaking. Uh, and it really, I don't know, set the stage for where I am right now. Um, I was a geology major at Carleton College, and I took Max's class um, somewhat on a whim. And he, he was teaching an Arctic system science class there, and uh, he started showing pictures of uh, the uh, field site in Chersky. And um, I, I don't know, I got pretty excited, applied for the program, um, got in. Um, yeah, sorry, Max was a visiting professor for one year at Carleton while I was a student there. And uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a smaller group. I think um, there was only, what, like 10 students that year. Um, and it was, uh, we, our one returning student got sick before we even made it to Chersky. He turned around in Moscow. So it was really just a bunch of fledgling uh, Polaris Project undergrads. And um, so that was a pretty unique uh, experience. We all kind of were going through the same um, new experience at the same time. And it was a great bonding experience. Um, the second year, uh, I think was more exciting for me scientifically because um, I, uh, sorry, someone talking about weather. <laughs> uh, second year was, uh, I don't know, more, four, we had four returning students, um, Aaron, Blaze, Joanne and I, um, and we went for actually a, a longer period of time than the normal Polaris stint, uh, which is usually just the month of July, we stayed an extra almost three weeks. So that was pretty interesting, saying goodbye to the entire Polaris project and seeing kind of the later summer. It was also uh, kind of an anomalous year. There was a lot of fires and um, smoke from uh, the peat fires. So a couple of days, um, the view around Cherokee was just completely hazed out. Um, but uh, both years have been different in terms of uh, weather a little bit. Our, my second year was drier, um, fewer mosquitoes. But uh, bring, uh, if there's one thing besides hot sauce I'd recommend bringing, it's a uh, plentiful uh, defense against bugs. Make sure you have a bug shirt, gloves, tall socks, long pants, um, because you, I don't know, it's, it can be miserable if you're sitting out in the field getting chomped to death by mosquitoes and, and horse flies. I don't know, what anyone have any other specific questions for me? I, I hope to talk more about uh, how the Polaris project led me into my graduate program, maybe more in person with people, but uh, I don't know if I can, should I turn this over back to you, Max? So you don't have to listen to me breathing. Yeah, I don't know. I'll, how about somebody else has something to say? Maybe Andy or Karen or Paul. I'll uh, turn my microphone off and wait. Hey guys, uh, I'm not quite sure what uh, what to say, but welcome. It's it's really good to to hear. Uh, for Max about what what you can expect this summer, and um, I am going to be heading over there for my third trip. Uh, yeah, so I'm a I'm a postdoc that works for uh, for Max, and uh, I work at the Woodsall Research Centre. I've spent 
three trips now in Siberia in the same place. My first trip was for a three month stint completely. Um, stayed there with the families, the Zimovs and the Davidovs. They're a, they're a fantastic, uh, amazing uh, series of people. They live in <laughs> incredibly hard conditions. Uh, the winters in, in Chesky can get to uh, minus 50 degrees, so they, they're very hardy Russian people. Uh, but they're wonderful, they, they're, they're so passionate about their science. So it's really a privilege that we can, that we can go and visit their station. And uh, you guys will all get to know each other, as Max said. You'll get to know us, you'll get to know each other extremely well, and hopefully we can excite you about some of the science uh, that you can learn about and, and, and actually start uh, testing for yourself in the field. So uh, I, hope, I hope you're all getting excited. Uh, I'm certainly getting very excited about meeting you all in the airport. If you're nervous, um, I think that's probably pretty normal. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, so I think you'll we'll, we'll meet you in the airport. Lots of uh, nerves, lots of excitement, and I think you'll have a fantastic time. Uh, my particular research um, focuses on well carbon dynamics in in large rivers. So quite general, um, I look at the brown material in rivers, if you like. So if you've ever stood next to a big river. I study quite what causes that uh, that brown coloration in the water, what the chemical composition of that water looks like, um, and how that affects what happens to it. So that that brown stuff, that carbon that that imparts color to the water, can come from a variety of different sources, from soils uh, at different depths, of different ages. And I tend to investigate, yeah, wh whether it uh, turns into uh, greenhouse gases that can that can uh, feed back into climate change concerns, or whether it actually gets taken out and modified further on the coast, or potentially it doesn't it doesn't get modified at all. So we do a whole series of experiments. Um, this involves <laughs> lots of lab work. But also lots of getting your hands dirty on lakes, streams, rivers, measuring uh, fluxes of gases, and measuring the amount of carbon in water, measuring what kind of um, bacteria feed um, feed on this material. But as as John has just suggested, we will uh, we'll discuss and give a greater feedback and uh, possibly have some slides to to talk about the results of previous year's work in, uh, in Chersky. But to begin with, uh, you're welcome and please feel free to start firing questions. You'll, you'll know all these people uh, too well very soon. So yeah, there you go. I'll pass it over to another postdoc now, I think, or somebody else. Uh, let me just say a couple things. Um, we are going to have more sessions as the month goes on. Um, and we'll get to more, hear more detail about what everybody's research interests are. I do think it's probably a good idea for some of us to just say for really briefly what, what we do. And I'll go ahead and tell you. I'm not going to be there, but uh, um, I will tell you what I'm interested in so that you know, if somebody wants to carry on the legacy of myself. And actually, Travis did some of this work. Um, we're in, interested in stream biogeochemistry, particularly uh, nitrogen and phosphorus cycling. Um, this group is very obsessed with carbon, which is good. They should be, but we also have an interest in other other elements. So uh, we've been doing some experiments the last few years to where we do little bits of uh, nutrient addition work, where we add a little bit of nutrient to the stream, and then we look at how fast it's taken up from the water column. And we can use that to measure whole ecosystem uh, nutrient cycling. And then we compare different streams for the, the rates of cycling of NMP, and, and, and we're thinking about carbon a little bit more. Um, in streams around uh, across the landscape, uh, you know, it's, we're, I don't know how much of that's going to get done this summer since I'm not going to be there. But uh, other folks are interested in those things, and we can talk more about it. I, I plan on giving a little bit more detail about what those experiments are like and what the questions are uh, later in the month. Um, but you're certainly welcome to ask questions about that anytime you wish. 
Um, and I'm going to stop. Uh, again, if you want to ask a question, you can raise your hand or send a chat. I'm watching the chats very closely. Uh, if uh, maybe we should have um, Karen. I'm just going to call Karen out and let Karen speak to us for a minute or two. All right. Hey, guys. Can you hear me all right? Oh, excellent. Okay. Um, so I don't want to speak for too, too long because um, I know you guys are probably uh, getting getting a bit tired of, of listening to, to people speak. Um, so I'll be brief and actually I, I think I'm going to have a chance to speak much more to you guys in the, the coming weeks. So um, I just want to uh, just briefly say that I'm a professor in the Graduate School of Geography at Clark University. Um, so I think I know a lot of the names on this list, um, but for those of you guys that don't know me, um, I certainly have pretty broad interests in thinking about all angles of biogeochemistry and how sort of carbon is transported uh, from terrestrial ecosystems through aquatic systems all the way down to the ocean as well. Um, and sort of one of the, the sort of guiding themes of what I tend to do has a lot to do with satellite remote sensing and uh, GIS. Um, as well. So a lot of the things that we do are, are, are quite important for thinking about how to scale up and how to extrapolate across the landscape to get a, a broader feel for how this area is actually um, uh, responding to, to climate change overall. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll stop there and um, turn over the mic to whoever wants to go next. Okay, Andy, I'm going to call you out. Why don't you say a word? All right. Um, welcome, everyone. It's good to see you. It's, it's uh, awesome to have this experience of talking to so many people on the Players Project. It's amazing. I'm um, another PI on the on the trip um, on the project I've been involved since the first year. I am also not going this year on the trip. I need a year off like John. Um, but I'm uh, excited that there are going to be so many good PIs. Karen is going, as is Max and Paul, and so there will be plenty of good folks there. Uh, I'm a forest uh, ecologist by training and inclination and was leading the terrestrial team last year that's going to be led this year by, uh, we've got a number of great terrestrial folks that are going to go and be working on trying to characterize the pools of carbon both above ground and below ground in the terrestrial ecosystem. So Dylan is a returning student who's going to be working on that project. Um, and maybe we can get Dylan to say something in a little bit. So get yourself ready, Dylan. Um, and then we also have a variety of sort of uh, people that have worked in Tristan before. My former grad student, Logan Berner, is going to be working on this uh, terrestrial part now, too. He now works at the Woods Hole Research Center. And it's been great to see the alums uh, of the Polaris Project go on to do so many awesome things. I mean, uh, Travis talking about being in the grad program like now. He rattled off a list of other previous students that had been with him in Chersky, um, I think all of which now are in graduate programs. I'm not sure, but I think, I think all of them are, uh, are the ones that Travis mentioned. So it's exciting. And it's going to be an amazing trip. Uh, it's going to be a life-changing trip. I don't think any one of the students that's been on the Polaris Project uh, in past years would tell you anything different. I think this is going to be, you're going to come back the end of July, a fundamentally different person than the, the one that left. You're going to be a uh, broader and richer and more intellectually curious human being. That's about all I've got. Um, maybe, uh, John, who do, you have, who do you have lined up next? It looks like uh, there's a popular support developing for Valentine. So Valentine, if you press talk, you can actually say a word to us, too. <laughs> I'm present. Can you see me? Hey, can you see me? Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Valentin. And I live in the area of investigation, <laughs> very close, <laughs> thousand kilometers or so. And uh, I work in the Permafrost Institute, and simultaneously, I'm uh, an assistant professor in the Northeast Federal University, the former Yakutsk State University. So this is my fourth year with Polaris, and uh, first time it was rather new for me too, uh, because uh, Yakutia is very uh, vast territory, it's about 3.2 million square kilometers, so <laughs> it was my first time to go there with Max and others, 
and well, I enjoyed it very much. And uh, first, I want to draw your attention to uh, the territory is uh, undula undulated by permafrost or perennially frozen ground, and uh, what we have talked here about uh, carbon, and we talking we are talking about the ancient carbon which uh, sedimented. Uh, sedimentated uh, simultaneously with uh, uh, deposits in, in Pleistocene and late Pleistocene, so uh, that's important. And one of my goals is to help you to understand permafrost features, phenomena, and processes. And uh, one more, uh, that, uh, I hope very much, and we did a lot uh, uh, by now, that uh, there will be some drilling. In, in Chersky, so we are, uh, we are looking forward to get some 5 to 10 meters bow holes with the core um, for investigations. So think about that. And, and another, another a student from our university, Varvara uh, Andreeva, and she also with us now, and um, she will teach you. She will teach you. Uh, also about the permafrost features and also Yakutian culture. Uh, thanks everyone. Okay, finished. <laughs>